Hi, this is Jay Washburn. And I'm Joe Bondosky. And you're listening to Start Writing. And we are still talking about dialogue. I feel like we've been talking about dialogue forever. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's been a long journey. Uh, so we talked about multi-layered dialogues last time and uh, action beats. And we talked about how uh, the action beat is a great moment to go into subtext. So now we're going to talk about kind of the direct opposite uh, of subtext, which is on the nose writing. And so you may have gotten this critique uh, sometimes and maybe didn't have a very clear. And so what happens is, is on the nose is just really, really direct. And so to, to we'll, we'll go into some examples as well, but essentially just lack subtext. The characters are saying exactly how they are feeling and everything from body language to words to emotion all match up. And it makes for great communication, but removes all tension and conflict from a scene. Mm. And there, there is exception to this, and, and we, we will look at some of the exceptions. But uh, one, one, one way you can kind of think of this uh, is if you're familiar with the character Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory, who either has Asperger's or autism, he always says exactly what he feels. <laughs> but it's usually done in what comes off as a very socially rude or awkward or selfish or or to make a joke by the fact that he doesn't recognize, you know, that it's selfish, awkward, rude, all of that. And he simply wants what he wants and he does not use subtext or recognize subtext. So we're going to look at a couple examples now here where we're talking about the use of it. Now, I will point out that when it comes to comedy, uh, the use of on the nose writing or pretty much any piece of writing advice, guidance, rule, whatever, in order to make a joke land, you can throw everything out and just do what makes it funny. And that's, that's kind of one of the, the rules behind comedy. But if the joke doesn't land or doesn't work, then it looks really bad. So it's always a little bit of a gamble to write a joke this way, but you will see a lot of writers, uh, do very on the nose writing for comedic effect. And that's definitely how Sheldon is done. Like it is always a comedic effect. But part of the brilliance of the Big Bang Theory is even though it is very on the nose writing and some of the dialogue and lines that they give him, he never breaks character because that is his character. Uh, so in, in this first little clip, I'm going to have you listen to uh, Sheldon is working on a physics problem that is giving him trouble. So he breaks into a child themed restaurant with a ball pit in the middle of the night and is using the balls to sort out his problem. And Leonard walks in and starts to ask him about it. And so we'll play that clip for you here real quick. Hey, Shelly. What you doing? Size ratio was all wrong. Couldn't visualize it. Needed bigger carbon atoms. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> How did you get into this place? Back door has a five-pin tumbler system, single-circuit alarm, child's play. <laughs> you can start sorting protons and neutrons while I build carbon atoms. No, I don't think so. We need to go home now. But I'm still working. If you don't come out of there, I'm going to have to drag you out. So you can you can hear the subtext in Leonard's voice, right? And at the same time, Sheldon is just completely unaware and just reacts, right? Like, but I'm still working, you know, or, you know, he finds him here in the middle uh, uh, of this, you know, restaurant that's closed down. He's broken in and they ask him what he's doing. And he's like, I'm building carbon atoms. What's it look like? Right. <laughs> you know, Just very on the nose. But because of the way the character has been created it never feels like they've broken any rules to get him to do it because that's the nature of his character and the way he understands the world. So I wanted to do that to kind of illustrate that on the nose writing, but also show uh, a place where it was really working. Yeah, Matt. And I just want to like reemphasize the point that the reason this works is because it's authentic to the character. Yes. And it wouldn't work if it worked. Well, a lot of, if the jokes were still landing, it would still be funny but it would not be a, as brilliant, right? It wouldn't be as awesome a creation as it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's creating the character who could say all these just on-the-nose comedic lines uh, and still be authentic was just an incredible creation by the writers of the show. Uh, that's, that's an example of on-the-nose writing when it works well. Let's look at how it can often fall apart when you do it and, and why they usually recommend you want to stay away from it 
you want to use some subtext. So here's some examples of on the nose. Uh, I'm really angry with you. I had a difficult life growing up. My father beat me. My mother didn't love me. It's very difficult to connect with people because of that. I'm really sad that my best friend died. Right? All of these lines are great communication, but there is no subtext. And because of it, it feels like there's no emotion behind them. They don't feel genuine, right? Because people are complicated. We hide our emotions. We entangle them in our experiences. Uh, we avoid saying certain things to certain people. Uh, a friend of mine told me uh, a story where he had picked up his brother at the hospital after a suicide attempt. And on the way home, oh. the hospitalized brother talked about how good things were going in his life for the entire drive home, almost half an hour. And only once in that entire time did he mention very briefly in just one sentence, things have been a little tight the last month. That's it, right? Yeah. I mean, clearly, that's not what's going on, right? And, and in that really extreme dire situation, it only leaks once, right? We communicate in subtext. Now, as we go into some of, as we convert some of these bad on the nose writing into some good subtext writing, you'll see that a lot of the character starts to come in as well. Uh, and so, wait, before you read this quote, now that is such a powerful example. Like you just relating that story to me and mentioning what wasn't said, it just like really got to me. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, so let's take this second line. I had a difficult life growing up. My father beat me. My mother didn't love me. It's very difficult to connect with people because of that, right? If you're in therapy, that's a great line, right? Communicate with your therapist. Awesome. But let's move it into subtext here. So my dad taught me to fight. Not at the gym. Not like everybody else. No. At night, when he came home late, stunk. But I learned a lesson that most people don't understand till they're 40. And it's this. Ain't nobody in this world going to fight for you except you. They're all too busy fighting for themselves to notice. So I fight for no one, and I'll fight anyone that gets in my way. Oh, right. Dude, that's good. Is that from a movie, or did you write that? I just wrote that. <laughs> that's a great. That's a great dialogue. That's awesome. Yeah, but so what we've done is, you know, he had a difficult life growing up. His dad beat him. His mother didn't love him, and he has a hard time connecting with people. And all of that is in this, but he never says any of it. But not only that, but so much of the character starts to come through, right? We get a piece of his backstory, right? I mean, even as I read it, I almost want to kind of say it in, in the lingo uh, uh, of an inner city kid, right? Mm -hmm. who, who grew up in, in the, on the edge of poverty. You, you get a strong sense of, of what's important to him. Not only what happened to him, you know, that, that, that on the nose writing, but his emotional reaction to it is to fight back. And, you know, all of that comes through in the subtext. And so not only do we build tension with that indirect communication, but it forces us to, to understand our characters more and their backstory, and it bleeds into how they use subtext to cover up these very direct pieces of communication. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, all right. So on the nose... Exposition and dialogue. So we have talked about, you know, you take, you take, you know, we, we did a bunch uh, of episodes on exposition. And one of the things we talked about was kind of moving pieces of it into dialogue. And so now we kind of want to talk about like, you don't just want to come out and just say it in dialogue. You still got to bury it in that subtext, right? So let's take this, this line uh, of direct exposition and dialogue. It's going to be very difficult breaking into that vault. <laughs> and, uh, but if you think about any heist movie you've seen, they usually don't come out and say this, you know, directly. Instead, they describe the challenges of getting into the vault. The goal is not to say it's going to be very difficult into the vault, but the goal is to get you, the audience, to think or even say out loud as you watch the movie, holy crap, it's going to be very difficult breaking into that vault, right? So here's here's a clip from Ocean's Eleven's planning scene as they're talking about how they're going to break into this vault. Gentlemen, the 3000 block of Las Vegas Boulevard, otherwise known as the Bellagio, the Mirage, and the MGM Grand. Together, they're three of the most profitable casinos in Las Vegas. 
Let me see. This is the vault at the Bellagio. It's located below the strip, beneath 200 feet of solid earth. It safeguards every dime that passes through each of the three casinos above it. And we're gonna rob it. Smash and grab job, huh? Slightly more complicated than that. Oh. Yeah. This is courtesy of Frank Catton, new blackjack dealer at the Bellagio. Okay, bad news first. This place houses a security system that rivals most nuclear missile silos. First, we have to get within the casino cages, which anybody will tell you takes more than a smile. Next, through these doors, each of which requires a different six-digit code changed every 12 hours. Past those lies the elevator. This is where it gets tricky. The elevator won't move without authorized fingerprint identification. Which we can't fake. And vocal confirmation from both the security system within the Bellagio and the vault below. Which we won't get. Furthermore, the elevator shaft is rigged with motion detectors. Meaning if we were to manually override the lift, the shaft's exit would lock down automatically and we'd be trapped. Now once we All right. Oh. So, yeah, you can hear. It very much is about converting it to a show, don't tell kind of moment. We're not going to tell you it's very difficult breaking into that vault. We're going to show you how difficult it is going to be to break into the vault. But I mean, there's very little that's visual. Most of what's going on is just a dialogue discussion. They have moved the exposition into dialogue. They're discussing it with the team. And that is what shows us how difficult this will be. Yeah. Now, I, I just want to, I don't know if this makes sense. Um, to me, it's going to be very difficult is a is a concept, maybe a fact. But what matters in the story is how a person reacts to that fact. And to me, it's almost like if, if you want the line of dialogue, it's going to be very difficult. What you need is a character reacting with a profanity or, yeah. or some sort of emotional reaction to that fact without stating it, but just feeling it. Um, and then someone could ask, you know, like, well, what's the matter? What's the sigh for? What's the... And then yeah. you could say, well, it's going to, it's going to suck. It's going to you know, suck. Or, or something like that. Anyway, that's just kind of my take on that off the cuff. But yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, just get somebody like, you know, they mention, uh, maybe they're talking about the motion sensors and there are motion sensors in the elevator. So that even if we override them, it will lock us inside and just get one of the characters to be like, geez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, perfect. Right. And so, yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, you can use that emotional reaction to then trigger another piece of dialogue and even break up some of the bigger chunks. Um, because, I mean, if we were looking at in the novel, uh, George Clooney's, you know, he goes for quite a while on some of these descriptions. Mm. All right. So I don't know if I'm going to keep this piece. I'm going to uh, give me your feedback after we finish this little section here. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, on the nose, unreliable characters. Um, so I see this a lot in like romantic dramas uh, or, or just dramas that are driven by relationships. And that is the love interest will have a conversation. They'll get a text or read a blog or, or see something on social media that has been carefully placed there by a character with nefarious intentions. And usually they, they don't have a very good reputation, right? The dialogue or the words in these messages tends to be very on the nose, but usually they drum up so much drama that the shortcomings are often overlooked. And uh, so I guess for me as, as an audience member, these bother me for two reasons. One, it is still on the nose writing, even though it does, you know, dial up the tension or the drama in the scene, right. it's still very on the nose. And two, it drives me crazy because, uh, you know, the love interest, you know, always believes this this source right like these people are known to be cross-motivated unreliable characters and yet they believe them they're like oh yeah i guess i should be careful around this person who i have this deep romantic intimate relationship because i got this text that said that you know it just drives me crazy well, so I, I can't think of a specific example from a movie but basically you're talking about like there's there's the the female and then the male lead and then yeah. there's like some other male character who's a little bit too smooth and you're just like kind of waiting for him to show his like the the dirtier side underneath underneath the veneer um and it's is that what you're talking about here that like they seem to be really no. perfect but you're so usually this will what will happen is you'll have the two love interests most of the time it'll be a, a guy and a girl and you know maybe they'll 
be out on a date or something and and they'll have a small disagreement or something and one of them will get a text from you know a, a jealous outsider who is interested in one of the two right and in the text it'll say something about the other one and suddenly they come back to the relationship very dubious and you know very mm-hmm. hands off and just fully believing whatever it is they've gotten in this message or maybe they just had lunch with the other person and in the conversation they told them this piece of gossip or whatever and you know for it, it just has always bothered me that they believe this piece of information from an unreliable character who is you know jealous or gossipy or whatever wholeheartedly but like you don't doubt this person rather than mm. you know you know rather than believing the person you're in the relationship they believe this person who's known to be unreliable and i guess as a as a as a plot device i always drove me crazy i don't know if it belongs yeah. here i don't know that this no. is the place to discuss it well, no, I think it's really interesting because you're essentially saying there's two layers here. One is when you're reading dialogue that's too canned, that's inauthentic, the reader can be skeptical. And that, that can like make the reader not trust the novel. But you can also have a character in the novel who is believing, who's not being skeptical like the reader is. And yeah, that upsets you that the that the character is not being skeptical like the reader is being skeptical yes that ha there you go thank you jay you fixed it (laughs) but yeah yeah because i mean the very thing that makes us avoid doing on the nose writing is because it makes us skeptical of the authenticity and yet when characters encounter it they are not and that that feels false yeah there you go. There you go. <laughs> My chaos, you found the gem. <laughs> no, no, great. You served it up perfectly. All right. Uh, so now we're going to talk about uh, a variation here. And so this is what... Uh, so if, you, if you're if you familiar with anime, they actually do a lot of on-the-nose writing. It's very much just part of how they write dialogue. And so while while avoiding it you know using subtext is very common and taught uh for in the western style for literature plays and cinema uh and it's used to build a tension it's it's not universal right with a lot of asian cultures that's not how they build tension in their stories and so the, the it has a, a an interesting effect in that there's a lot of very strong fans of uh the anime genre and I think a lot of it has to do with this on the nose writing that they do. Uh, for one, right, if, if, if a person is a really good and effective communicator and, you know, they're constantly seeing, uh, moments in, in, in uh, stories where, you know, tension is born out, uh, of these, the subtext and this poor communication, it can be very frustrating to them. Be like, how come people don't just communicate the way they're supposed to, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, you know, if people who are very frustrated by the lack of clear communication in, in narrative can be very drawn to anime because the, com- the characters are very good about communicating, you know, exactly what they're thinking and feeling when they're thinking and feeling it. It's very on the nose. Uh, and at another level, um, you know, in the line of subtext we did, there there wasn't a lot of like body language and tonality to it, but a lot of subtext can still be buried in those action beats as we talked about. And uh, Sheldon is a is a great example, you know, because of his mental limitations, he has trouble reading tone and body language and context in that frame. And so a lot of people, you know, he's not alone in that. There are millions of people who have uh, uh, similar difficulties reading those kinds of things. And so they are very drawn to anime as well, because they don't have to figure out the subtext uh, of the body language and the tone, because the characters say exactly what they're thinking and feeling when they say it. Matt, so this reminded me of something uh, that I've worried about. So I've tried to study communication, and I've tried to become a better communicator. And maybe I'm just patting myself on the back, but sometimes I worry that I make my characters a little too studied in that. Oh, that's interesting. It's something I just have to watch out for. Like, okay, this would be a good way to communicate it, but would this character actually do that? And so that's something I'm constantly struggling with because I know, I at least I think I know how to communicate well. And I can't give that gift to all of my characters. I think it's fine to give it to some, you know, one or two maybe. But yeah. anyway, it's an interesting balance. 
So with this very on the nose writing that is that is done in the anime and and the Eastern style, uh, they don't try to build any tension on it uh, because if they did, it wouldn't it wouldn't work very well. And so they have to build the tension in a lot of other ways in their stories. And so uh, it, it, again, if you're familiar with the anime genre, they tend to be very action heavy, right? Mm-hmm. Like very intense and that is part of how they have shifted the tension point of a story to these miscommunications and subtext to just a physical uh action point yeah and i'm so glad you brought this up too i've i've seen some anime um and i think most of what i've seen is more westernized but some of what i've seen has just kind of seemed strange to me and i couldn't quite put a finger on what was so strange about it but I think this just finally clicked the light on in my brain. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, it's because of this. Anyway, that's a really cool insight that you just shared. Yeah. So I'm going to play a line, a couple lines of dialogue from an anime here. And you'll hear like, so so the scene is that this prisoner has been. In, so So the guy is a guard and then the female is the prisoner. And he has come to pick her up to take her to the interrogation room. And this is the dialogue that happens between the two of them as they walk. Lean wasn't caught. They're searching for him. I have no idea where that little traitor could be hiding. Hmm. So, it's just <laughs> short little line. But again, like, he's kind of just put all his cards on the table, right? Yeah. Like, the interrogator just told her everything she needs to know. He's not holding anything back. And it's very on the nose, you know? Just, <laughs> like, that's, that's like the exact thoughts in his head that he probably shouldn't have said out loud. That is so funny. <laughs> but again, the the way they structure their plot lines and everything is they they're, they're not trying to build tension on mm-hmm. on the subtext and, and you know what 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 are the cards they're hiding that way. You know, it's it's action and and just other plot points where they try to build their tension. Huh. Yeah, that's so interesting. We did talk about comedy and I'm just going to circle it back around here. Uh, so that, you know, uh, the, the first rule in any comedy is you have to be funny and you can break any rule, advice, guidance or anything to do that, because that's that 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 is the number one purpose that people are coming to you. But if you can stay in character like uh, a Sheldon, then you can, you know, ha- have a, a far superior uh, creation. But like I said, you can do that on the nose writing in, in comedic uh devices and, and have it still work as long as your jokes are still landing. And so that is on the nose. Did we miss anything? Uh, I don't I don't think so. So uh for uh for your writing exercise this month, the the, the task here is to just go through your dialogue and see if you can find anything that is on the nose. So go through your work in progress manuscript, pick a chapter that's maybe dialogue heavy. And see if you've got either an exposition line or maybe just, uh, you know, just a character talking about what they're thinking and feeling that is uh, a little too direct and convert it to that subtext. Like we did with the, I had a difficult uh, life growing up, which was then converted to my dad taught me to fight, you know, and just no, that, do- that was such a great example. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, when it came, I mean, it was after I wrote it that I realized just how much character had to go into the line for it to work in subtext. Mm. And uh, yeah, I think so. uh, That's the end of our episode. So it's time to start writing. Uh, uh, So I have re I brought the start writing Facebook page back to life just as as we're going forward. Um, We do have a Patreon if you want to check us out there and then of course you can email us at uh, please start writing at gmail.com or jbendoski at gmail.com either of those will answer um but you know just as we're planning and, and preparing to to kind of take the podcast to the next level we are uh just trying to get everything set up and, and working right now and as always if you want to support the show you can check out one of our books and thank you for listening